Packing for Mars. The space program, as most people understand it, is completely a front. They don't want us to know. There's a monolith. They deliberately smudged certain things. There's a whole nother reality going on out there. There really is another cost to the human race, the breakaway civilization. We're all coming forward with information and evidence that Alternative 3 is not some science fiction thing. Science fiction thing. People go through their lives on autopilot all the time. You wake up, you make breakfast, you go off to work, you do your thing, you belong to the machine for eight hours, you come home. But what people don't realize is that they need the truth. Thank you for watching our TV, our Alpine Parliament studio videos. We are recording now. Uh, something which is very interesting. This is Packing for Mars. We have Frank Jacob and uh, Tonya Maidenford. You are a producer of films. I am the director of the, this film, Packing for Mars. And Tonya is a, a Hollywood producer, executive producer and filmmaker. And uh, we like to, on the one hand, uh, produce things uh, in the conventional system, such as you know television shows or uh, Tonya does... Uh, fiction films in Hollywood, um, but uh, in our spare time and uh, for our own recreational uh, use or for our own uh, spiritual desire or whatever you want to call it, our contribution to the awakening of consciousness, we like to make films about subjects which are forbidden. Aha, uh -huh. but not by law. <laughs> not by law, but by the, uh, the pact between the, those who stand guard in the system of... Um, you know, mediocrity and keeping us thinking in a certain box and those who are wanting to shake up the box and wake us up to our fullest no potential of the without any limitation. What was your inspiration to do this film, this Packing for Mars? My was inspiration? It your inspiration? Well, or? it's, you know, we, we, we came yeah. together in the course of making the film, but I guess the, the original inspiration originated with me uh, because I, I had been given this book, Alternative 3, uh, now, this book is no ordinary book. It's a book based on a, a 1977 British television program which described uh, a very secretive group of people who had uh, more or less decided that humanity was not going to be able to clean up uh, the environment and change their ways of being in time before it became extinct. Uh, so they decided to come up with alternatives and one of those alternatives was to build a base on the planet Mars for a survival colony of humans to land and wait out until uh, the problems, you know, sorted themselves. Who is privileged uh, on, to on throw, Earth. go to the Mars? Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, the reason I decided to go and make a film about it was not because, you know, I thought the, it was an interesting subject. It was. It is an interesting subject, and it's a great book that followed the program. But what was interesting was that I'd heard an interview with the great granddaughter of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, Laura Eisenhower, describing um, how she had been recruited for such a Mars colony. And I thought to myself, "What? You know, is this this is real? This book is real?" Because the person who gave me the book, they said it's a true story, masked as science fiction. What if the majority of well-meaning scientists are actually basing their research on pre-screened, filtered data? What if the reality of Mars was so far from the official story that we would never believe it? Isn't history replete with stories of nation leaders that told us lies so big, so outrageous, no one could believe they were lies? They got away with it because we trust our leaders to tell the truth, and nothing but the truth. To believe the opposite requires us to set aside all convention and adopt a way of thinking that directly confronts the core of our trust in the whole system. 
what's interesting about this whole premise of Alternative 3 is when we released Packing for Mars, that this whole journey, our logline for the film is one man's journey for truth, because it really was one man grabbing a backpack, going out looking for the answers. And it was all inspired on Alternative 3, but we didn't know Leslie Watkins was still around. Uh -huh. And so now it's been 40 years later, two weeks exact to the time we released Packing for Mars. I got an email from Graham Watkins, who's Leslie Watkins' son. And basically they were re-releasing Alternative 3 40 years after the sci-fi cult classic hit, hit the airwaves. And they were bringing out all new information and relaunching this book. This was a great collaboration to be able to come out at the same time. Uh, we now have the book and the film with all this incredible information that even Leslie brought to the table. And as Frank had described, he had faced so many challenges. Uh, people that had come out of the woodwork asking him, how much do you know? You know, you really knew more than you had shared. Uh, Mae Brussels considered Alternative 3 the most dangerous book on her shelf. So, Frank, can you explain the people... Uh, what is alternative three, these three alternatives we have on this planet? Well, the, um, as we know, the third alternative was going to Mars, but the other two alternatives were kind of interesting. And the first one was to just blast huge holes in the ionosphere to try and let the um, carbon gases and the, the, uh, the greenhouse gases escape <laughs> into outer space and thereby cooling down the planet. The problem with that, of course, was that although they had the technology to make holes into the ionosphere, they didn't have the technology to seal them back up again. So they didn't go that route, of course. The second alternative was to build giant underground cities where they would be able to pull a selected group of artists, doctors, scientists, and, and people that they would you know, live for many years in a sheltered environment away from the pollution and the chaos while the, the world upstairs uh, you know, went its its way to absolute annihilation and destruction, and then they would emerge, of course, later. Could I, I be a member too? To this I will. Club, I'll, I'll, I'll ask <laughs> Leslie. Maybe he can. Uh, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but the funny thing is that you know the alternative too. Uh, it, it was it was ironic that the writers or the authors of the uh, the book and the film or the book thought that alternative uh, two um, was not feasible, but you know nowadays we hear so much about underground bases, mm -hmm. uh, deep underground bases. You know the dumbs, as they call them, deep underground military bases, which are around the planet. You know they're in Pine Gap in Australia, they're in uh, Area Fifty One, and and uh, Ice you Rock, know, probably Australia and, too. They could be exactly. There's there. So they're apparently you know this idea of the underground bases. Uh, I'm not so certain they didn't go this way either. The thing that that uh, was interesting is that. It, it basically for you to believe the premise or even entertain the idea that this could be going on, you have to accept the idea or be willing to go with the idea that uh, technology as we know it, as it's sold to us on television and the mainstream and in our education system, is not the technology which is really being used by those who are running this program. But how is it this possible to, to hide these technologies, those people, they are involved. How is this possible to keep this secret? Uh, it's a very good question. And we call it um, the breakaway civilization. And, uh, and this is a term that, uh, that Richard Dolan, the famous American author, uh, um, sort of coined. I don't know if he originally coined it, but he's one of the early uh, users of this term, the breakaway civilization. Now, what is the breakaway civilization? And, and how do they operate is, is kind of one of the things that we explore in the film. Now, let's imagine the society that is involved in engaging all of this stuff. They have radically advanced technology. They have um, interactions with beings that most of us don't have the opportunity to have. They've developed a different world view, I guarantee you, over how, what our place in the cosmos happens to be. Now ask yourself, what is a civilization? What characterizes a unique civilization? Well, that's a tough question to answer, but you can look at a couple of things. Levels of technology certainly are important. Worldview is certainly important. Um, in both of those ways, this clandestine world is actually very qualitatively different from the world that we here live in. And I think that that can qualify them in many important ways as a separate civilization one that has broken away from our own. The breakaway civilization seems to be a group of people, 
powerful people that have influence over governments at very, very high level, way above the level of the presidency or way above you know, the science divisions. It seems there's a, an elite group of people with very, very much power who can decide um, historical events and, or, or who can control uh, things when they happen because they seem to have access to controlling the mainstream media uh, they seem to have access of influence in the educational system, and and about 1947, at the at the I think the latest we could go back, and if not earlier, there was a famous incident in America called the Roswell crash, which mm -hmm. is uh, one of the most well documented cases of a crash of an alien vehicle in the desert of America near Roswell, and uh, the materials that they found in this crash, including beings. Um, was taken into uh, secret bases and they began a process which I think is responsible for why they have this technology to today and that is the idea of reverse engineering advanced technologies. Now, uh, if these beings that they found came from another planet or from another time, um, nobody knows and it's not necessarily our desire to explain where they come from but it's clear that there seems to be an input uh, into society from a very advanced level of technology that uh, gave them um, such a powerful uh, technology that it's so far away uh, from what we are told exists that a nobody would really believe it exists just like if we were to go back a hundred years with an iPhone and uh, onto the streets of New York and begin videotaping the people uh, there on the no street. Nobody would believe it. And they would think it's magic, yeah. you know. And the the technology that the breakaway civilization works with is, you know, the teleporters, you know, the the time travel machines, uh, and the 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 technology, the jump rooms that gets them to places in the universe or, or within our solar system, which we just cannot or will not believe because it's such a confrontation with everything we've learned. Uh, so that and control of the media and the use of the educational system and the use of hiding what we call things into the public. You know, a lot of people felt uh, Leslie Watkins was an agent for these elite who took uh, the truth of this colony, wrote a fictional story and put it into the mainstream. And when people read it, it was sold as science fiction. And everyone went, yeah, that's the great science fiction. But that couldn't be happening because we were told we haven't even gotten to the moon yet. The truth behind. And so they put the truth right in the open. And everyone thinks it's a crazy science fiction story. It makes you wonder about a lot of the sci-fi films. It's like you write a novel and then you can write whatever you want if you tell the truth. Yes, you can write I it. Every, a, the a truth is stranger than fiction. I'm Andrew DiBasciago. I'm a lawyer in private practice in Washington State. I hold five academic degrees, including a Bachelor's of History from UCLA and a Master of Philosophy from the University of Cambridge. Ten years ago, I began investigating my experiences in DARPA's Project Pegasus in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Uh, I was a child participant in the early days of time-space exploration by the U.S. government. Project Pegasus was the real Philadelphia experiment. It was the U.S. time-space program at the time of its emergence. We were working with two technologies primarily uh, to access past and future events. The first was a teleporter that was being developed from papers that Nikola Tesla had left at the time of his death in 1943. Mr. Tesla, you were once a very wealthy man. You worked with J.P. Morgan, didn't you? We were given a great opportunity. And what was that opportunity? It had to do with the course mankind has chosen and the one it might have chosen, which would have led in a very different direction. We were regularly jumping through a device at the old Curtis Wright Aeronautical Company facility in Woodridge, New Jersey, and popping back into view on the grounds of the state capitol complex in Santa Fe, New Mexico. The experience of teleporting was almost emotionally overwhelming for a small child. Um, we had jumped into a vortal tunnel that had been opened up in the fabric of time space. As Jack Pruitt, one of the team leaders on Project Pegasus, once described it, the, the teleporter was creating an interstitial chasm in the fabric of time space. So. I found myself rushing forward seemingly at a great rate of speed, 
but also sometimes I felt I was falling downward. Um, and sometimes I felt I wasn't moving at all. Really what was happening was rather than, than the teleporter digitizing us, you know, disintegrating us and then reintegrating us at the destination, it was wrapping the universe around us and we, we were passing through to a new location on, on the earth. When I would look to the side of the tunnel, I would see bands of light that were moving at an incredible rate of speed. And in them, I could see a, a multiplicity of, of events going on in other on other timelines, rapidly rushing past. And then after several seconds of that, we would see a light at the end of the tunnel. It would approach very quickly, as if it was going to hit us. And we would find footfall uh, in New Mexico. There's a lot of scientists, there's a lot of military whistleblowers, there's a lot of people now coming forward sharing their truth. And in doing that, a lot of technologies that are mm -hmm. being disclosed, technologies that we thought until now could never exist, could not possibly be something that we're using. And it sounds total science fiction. When you get into time travel and teleportation and biolocation and some of the things that they're doing now, it's, it's quite extraordinary. We have but people in the film talking about their experiences but as uh, whistleblowers. If you uh, talk the truth, it's, it's dangerous today. I heard uh, a week before a film, uh, a song from Reinhard May. He's a famous uh, mm -hmm. songwriter in Germany. He, at the end of the, of the song, he sings, if you tell the truth, you need a very fast horse. <laughs> It's very true. I mean, it's obviously, uh, if you imagine with these rackets, they go to the, wherever, they, to the space. This is 70 years old, this technology. Yes. And it's, I think it's like a game to, to waste um, tax money and all. To it's show business. Hold this in hope, but not truth. It's show business. Show business. You know? The space program, as most people understand it, is completely a front. But the interesting part of that is that most of the scientists and engineers working in those projects don't realize they're part of a front. What happens is you could even call it the first tier of a filtering system. There's credible testimony that human teleportation exists, that faster than light travel exists, that the ability exists to look through portals into a future time to see probable future timelines. There are definitely technologies that exist, and I know this for a fact right now, that could take our, our space uh, program into a totally different direction, a much more advanced way of traveling. Um, it doesn't even have to be jump rooms. It doesn't even have to be teleporters. There's technology now that uh, can, be, can be developed, but there is a... Uh, a system in place Control which system. profits mm -hmm. which profits from the slow drip feeding uh, of, of technology and resources to the rest of the unknowing masses who are all, of course educated to believe within the limitations of their box so that they become the good consumers that they do not ask the questions and so the truth is dangerous the truth is even more dangerous because for those who are giving you pieces of the truth that um, that can empower you to make, uh, you know, decisions. Um, you know, our stories, um, you know, we put out things that um, is, is uh, what is considered to be truthful by those we find who tell us their story. We want to tell, uh, we want them to tell their truth in our films. Um, and we don't want to filter uh, and, and their truth. We want them to tell us their truth if it's real or not, it doesn't necessarily matter so much because it's open for everybody to decide. It's, it's, it's open for everybody to decide, and we want to put it on the public record that there, and we want to put it on the record in a very cinematic and entertaining and beautiful way because um, there's this mental barrier a lot of people have when they see a film on YouTube and it's very poor quality. They believe that it must be, you know, not real. It must be fake because if it was true, somebody would, you know, put something into it. And, uh, and if, of course, this doesn't happen. So we think that if we can put a film out there, which, which for the first time, probably in German uh, in speaking territory, goes in way down the rabbit hole into exopolitics in a, in a way that only a film in Hollywood might do. But it's not fiction. It's a true story. The story that is being told by the whistleblowers, the researchers, the scientists like Andrew Bishago, like... Uh, Laura Eisenhower, like J.J. Hertog, Lucas Ganton Borlo. He came forward with some really original footage yes. and information. Things like Project Red Sun that he shared, and we, we went into Apollo 19 and 20 missions in the film. The Apollo 20 mission occurred in August 1976. 
they launch a modified Saturn V from the band by Air Force Base. The Apollo 20 mission was a very difficult mission, first of all because they were on the far side of the moon, uh, also because it was a very long mission. Uh, according to what they told me, it was a seven days mission on the surface. Two astronauts alone on the surface of the moon for seven days. Both of the mission were American-Soviet uh, programs. Apollo 19 as a crew composed by, by two American and one Soviet, a Russian cosmonaut, and also the Apollo 20 mission as a crew composed by two Americans, and the third one was a very famous Soviet cosmonaut, Alexei Leonov. Did you have had any attacks against you because of the film? Because there's so much truth in this film, it's a, a hot device. <laughs> I'll let Tanya this to that one. Film. Well, we've, we've had some, I'll, I'll be politically correct, we've had some difficult challenges to, to, to navigate around. Uh, we're definitely on the radar screen. But I think with, with, with all truths, I think it's just important that we stay on course and continue releasing the information because, as Frank shared, it's important to give everybody a voice. We're, we're not the filter, we're simply the platform to let everybody speak their truth. We, even from a cinematic standpoint, we were, we were always filming a, a lot of times when people had these incredible stories, we would get really tight into the eyes, into the face, so we could get into the soul of that, of that story and mm -hmm. the person telling that story because the eyes are the window to the soul and somebody's telling you their truth, we leave it to the audience, whether they resonate with that or not. Or not yeah. Because it's really, in the end, your truth as, a, as an observer. They showed me images, things that they had uh, recorded. And I don't know how it's possible, except, well, at the time I didn't know. Now I know that they can move through time as easily as we move from one room to the next. The technology that's used by the extraterrestrials is something that's here now on this world. To be able to move from point A to point B through a bi-directional wormhole, I can assure you, um, it's not only possible, but it's happening as we speak. It's, it's out there. You know, we told the people in the film, look, we're putting you on camera and we're gonna be documenting this story and putting it out there for the whole world. So, you know, you have to take personal responsibility for everything that you tell us, <laughs> you know, and uh, because, and that, that's why I believe that the, the people that we have in the film really are, um, are exploring their own truths in some ways. We had, we had testimony from people in the film that never, uh, ever released the information to anybody. Uh, But before. why can they talk on your film? Uh, without getting any problems? Well, we think that A, it has to do with the idea that the information is really so far out. I mean, <laughs> you know, we thought we would never get any, um, any, any problems because nobody would believe it anyway. You know, mm -hmm. they think, most people would think, you know, okay, they think they're on Mars, you know. Uh, but um, that was for a while our protection. But, and we also had another method. We thought we will never tell anybody about this film as we made it. We spent five years making this film in absolute silence. We didn't tell our family members or our friends or anybody or colleagues that we were making this film about this crazy subject. And we quietly brought it out. And it's interesting to observe that now that we've brought it out, um, and it's suddenly it won you know, the People's Choice Award and it's making a circu circling around the globe. People in Australia where we met at Nexus uh, have seen it and there was a sold out screening in Sydney since then and there's more uh, screenings happening around the planet. It seems like all of a sudden the film is, uh, is connecting uh, and now is the first time, as, T as Tanya mentioned, that we're noticing some strange anomalies um, taking place to stop, maybe to try and, uh, and create some friction uh, or interference uh, with us continuing to bring the film out. Thank you for Mars. Uh, is the question, if they once are on the Mars, what's going on? Do they stay forever or, or would they come back to the Earth if there's everything okay again and everybody's disappeared? Yeah. I What mean, is the... the the uh, Mars agenda um, 
and alternative three, of course, never defines uh, this back and forth. They kind of say, we're going there to establish this colony. Uh, and they don't really get into the topic of, um, you know, coming back to Earth or when or how. Uh, what's interesting about what we learned from some of the people in the film is that they actually have the technology um, on the one hand to uh, to carry uh, large equipment and large amounts of uh, and heavy weights uh, to the planet um, in, fr in like what we consider freighters, space freighters. But on the other hand, uh, they have technology which allows a, a one or two or a small group of people to enter almost like an elevator, like you would go into an elevator and click a button, and then minutes later you're at the location in Mars and you're able to have lunch there, as one of the people in our film uh, you know, very comic comically states, and then come back again to Earth you know, in a flash. You're back here again after having lunch there. There were two great discoveries of the last century in quantum mechanics. One was the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, and the second was quantum non-locality and quantum teleportation. What did he say it was? He said, um, he said they're not called stargates. Jump gates. Jump gates. No, 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 no. He said, he said they're jump rooms. Jump he said they're jump rooms. In case you, you're not following this, a, a jump gate is allegedly a stable, traversable wormhole between two locations which works whenever you want to go. So, I mean, apparently there seems to be um, this ability to go technologically, but but we also uh, wanted to explore not just this idea of a colony there now, because Mars seems to have a correlation with planet Earth that goes back hundreds or thousands of years. Um, you know, there's, there's 369 words of the English language that are based around Mars. And all of these words that are happening on the planet are seeming to talk about great cataclysms or very intense, emotional or powerful things that took place on the planet. And from what we learned with, from J.J. Hertog and some of his paleoarchaeological work is that there definitely is um, lining up of places on Earth that line up with places on Mars. There are structures on Mars that are seemingly directly related to a pyramid culture that goes back into our antiquity of our times, including language, mathematics, and, uh, and alignments. Um, so there seems to be a cultural connection between the Earth and Mars that goes way back before recorded history, which is very fascinating. So the idea of a connection with Mars seems to be inherent in our whole culture. According to Arab historians, at the time the foundations of the city of Cairo were laid, there was a special orientation with Mars. And why do we have, even in the New Testament of our Bible, a reference by the Apostle Paul on Mars Hill to the Greek philosophers, suggesting that they take a look at what is, could be called the temples of the gods in Greek mythology or Greek legend. Certain alignments and aerial perspectives were specifically there in Egypt with respect to Mars, with the traditions of the Zulu people in East Africa, with the traditions of the peoples of the Orient, and certainly with the peoples of Central and South America, all who are, shall we say, proclaiming the fact that we need to take a second look at Mars and recognize that something happened there that connected the earlier mythology, intellectual history, and cosmology of ancient civilization with this mysterious sister planet. I think there must be parallel technology that you, let's say you can go by spiritual, spiritually to somewhere else and you leave your body here. Ingo Swan. And uh, you have the, the, the information of your body within your spirit and then you can materialize again somewhere else. Otherwise, it's impossible because there's a light speed and the right. mass, which is going to be uh, very more heavy and heavier. You can't go faster than right. uh, a light speed. Right. Well, you're talking about something which often is referred to as remote viewing, which was developed by the CIA and starting in the 60s. In particular, one of the characters was Ingo Swan, who, was, uh, who has a famous... Uh, history in dealing with the CIA and doing some of this remote viewing. You know, remember that, that story about him having transported mm -hmm. his, his, uh, his senses to, to the moon? It's interesting. Packing for Mars was five years in the making. And since uh, we had started making the film through the, out the whole journey, uh, there's been a lot of military whistleblowers and even, even uh, individuals, private individuals that have come forward. I know some of the more um, uh, well-known 
whistleblowers are Corey Good and Randy Kramer, which we touch upon in the film with with uh, Michael Sala, and the technologies that that they were using and they were involved with sometimes in thirty year missions. Uh, Michael Sala did a recent presentation at Nexus talking about how even with these programs they were age digressing these commanders, sergeants, military personnel in their in their missions and we had talked about this before but they were using these time travel technologies to actually conceal the time travel programs themselves and then you have the remote viewing aspect with Ingo Swan. The military is involved with a lot of technologies different levels of technologies and it's and it's interesting when you had asked about you know how long will they stay there will they come back Laura Eisenhower uh, brings up a really good point in packing for Mars and that is we really need to focus here on Earth with all the with all the issues we have this is the planet this is our planet we came here for a reason and i think the focus in the end really needs to be about here not what's out there or how long do we stay or do we come back here or do we go out there or if that's a a no arc plan the choice not to go to mars is more the commitment to stay on earth and balance these energies here on this planet before we really journey into the stars and onto other planets is to establish a peaceful world first before we go and make the same mistakes somewhere else it's like the thought of going to Mars was like a death. It was, you know, like separation anxiety from the mother. And the, the feeling was so strong in me that these colonies that have been there um, were, were created as a diversion to the highest potential we have here on Earth. There's just no reason to go anywhere else. We'll keep running from one problem and creating it somewhere else if we don't do it right here, right now. And we owe this to our planet. We owe this to our mother. I think that's a solution for both. Uh, the, these guys, they want to go to the Mars. They can go. And we have freedom <laughs> on Earth. I think that's yes. a, a, like a purification of the system. Send them on. Send all Send them on, people. Bitch. Everybody can go. I would stay alone with a few people <laughs> here and then live a fantastic life here in health and freedom. Why not? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, th- those people, they are the people. They make problems. That's yes. the problem. You could say that very much. Yeah. What is the conclusion of the film? Uh, well, you're coming close to the end of our interview. I mean, the conclusion, I think, um, you know, the film is will take you down an incredible and wild ride uh, and, and expose you to some things that might deeply disturb you in, in some ways and, uh, and should. Um, but I think the conclusion is that, you know, we're in a process of waking up all over the planet and the lines have been drawn. Those people who want to stay in the box are staying in the box and those people who no longer can buy into the system of ideologies and beliefs and technology that we've been trained to accept are breaking away and they're waking up and they're sharing information and they're putting out um, you know, that, the, the signals and the frequencies that will bring us hopefully into more of an enlightened you know, time uh, uh, on, on the planet. And I think these cycles and these phases have been, they've been, they've been um, you know, uh, predicted by even, you know, like, like we talk about in Solar Revolution with the Maya, you know, the, the, the galactic, the Hunab Ku, the ray from the center of the galaxy, How which will awaken disappear? us. The miles. Right. Oh, I mean, they, maybe they. Nobody they, knows. Nobody uh, knows, you know. But uh, I think that we're in that. They've, there, there's a prog, uh, uh, oh, as they say, predicted time where we will wake up on the planet and move into a new level of consciousness. And it's almost, you know, whether it's a timeline or whether it's people that will disappear or die off, who knows? I don't really want to define that. I don't think we really want to define that. But we want to. Creative. We wanted to create a film which will uh, maybe cause you to question your version of reality a little bit. And if that, if it's done that and made you maybe confront some things which may not be true, then then we've already made a positive. What impact. was the intention to uh, produce the film also uh, in German language? We were invited to uh, yeah. to talk and, and um, about it uh, in front of a like on another German. Um, uh, station and we didn't you know we thought okay uh, and we had presented it at in Salzburg at a in its original at English Mozart, language at the Mozart, Mozart Kino. Oh, yeah. One of the oldest theaters. And so they in invited us to come and talk about it and, and we talked about it and amazingly the next day after they released our interview there were over uh, you know tens of thousands of people 
that watched this interview. So we thought, oh my God, there's a lot of German friends out there. And we did who, Solar Revolution you know, in German and, and we French. did Solar oh, Revolution yes. in German and French. And we thought, you know, this information obviously needs to be put out into the German language because the German people seem to be hungry for it. And there may be a very important, maybe the German speaking territory is, is, a, is a critical um, collective mind that is going to help push, you know, and participate in steering us into this age of enlightenment. More open here than, let's say, in America. America okay. is because Becoming closed and it's becoming policed and more and more it isn't the America free America that it was in the 50s it's become this militant almost uh, controlled and FEMA and whatever else the Homeland Security which is nothing else than uh, a signal of fear about the people they, absolutely that's because they must hold them under uh, uh, under control yes. and don't uh, they don't get all the informations because well, the of good this. news in america though too is that a lot of this information is getting out and I, they have a lot of conferences there are a lot of radio shows there are a lot of television shows there's a lot of webisodes and so i think it's really important to be spreading this information around the world like in uh, europe and in australia and, yeah. and branching it out into other languages there are many great even even authors here in germany that are not known in the states and vice versa so i think it's really important now to to get the message globally, even in South America and other parts of the world. So I mean, the more pressure you give to somebody, the more you get pressure against you. That's probably the problem. They don't see. Mm. You should do something, do something for something and not against. The more they hide something, the more we are, get interested in what's in the background, yes. what's behind. That's Absolutely. It. Where we can get the film and or where we can get it and watch it, the URL is www.packingformarsmovie.com. And we actually have the English websites and there's a German uh, I mean, you can variation. watch it on the website or you can, you can buy the DVD. Or you can buy yeah. the DVD in both English and German. And you can see there's a website is both English and German. And the, mm -hmm. uh, the German extension is slash DE at the end of the dot com. Um, so, uh, you know, we um, make the film available in multiple, multiple on formats on Real House yes. and on, the, on Amazon. It's as much as you can. Yeah, and join us, uh, like us on Facebook and, and, uh, and spread the message. Yeah. I wish you success with these two you. films and whatever you do in the future. Thank you for coming Thank you, to Martin. Force, to the TV station of the Alpine Parliament, Tonya and uh, Frank. Thank you for coming and all the best. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, thank you for joining us on the TV and we see you next time. Thank you. <laughs> Let's get 9-11! 9-11 was an inside job!